Hello everyone and welcome to today's WorkSafe Tasmania Month webinar, MSD Risk Analysis, a Data-Driven Approach. I'm Stephanie Borowski from WorkSafe Tasmania and I will be your moderator. Before we start, we ask that you take a moment to read the following slide about information received today. I'll now, I'll now explain how to participate in today's webinar. Please use the questions window on your control panel to type and submit questions at any time during today's webinar. Questions will be addressed at the end of today's presentation. The presentation will also play a video without sound. Only presenter webcams will be used and today's webinar is being recorded. I would now like to introduce your presenter Michael Lawrence, Director of Ergonomics at Joint Action Group PTY LTD. Michael is delivering today's webinar in place of Joint Action Group's Dr Forbes Smith and Gary Gosling who could not be with us today. Michael has worked for 20 years in the areas of safety, injury prevention, injury management and ergonomics in a range of state and national industries including underground mining, horse racing, shearing, building and construction, health, electricity and gas, manufacturing, warehousing, transport and logistics. He is trained in occupational therapy, ergonomics and safety. He has also completed research in workplace design in hazardous manual work injury prevention. Michael's first 20 years of working life as a shearer provided a good grounding for sustaining consistent physical performance while managing musculoskeletal health. Welcome, Michael. Thank you very much, Stephanie. So what is risk? We're exposed to it all the time and the last 20 months has really given personal and political and health um, relevance really to, to this discussion in that, that we're all um, intensely aware of exposure to risk at the moment and how we manage it. Um, I heard somebody say recently that in the plant and equipment machinery um, safety management and in heavy industry that the machine itself isn't going to jump up and bite you. It's not until uh, somebody starts doing something with it that people are exposed to, to the hazard. And I'm sure I'm speaking to people where this is your bread and butter, but it's probably, particularly when dealing with work-related musculoskeletal risk and risk analysis, it's worth just pausing for a minute and thinking about this. Um, I like to think about it as a situation involving exposure to danger in, in plain language. When it comes to musculoskeletal disorder, and there is a prize for somebody who can come up with a better word, um, it, it's one of those situations, it's not unique, uh, but it is one of those health or, or safety or both matters where there is a little bit more to it than exposure to say a risk of fall, or maybe I shouldn't say more to it, but different, um, because it's exposure to something that is very dose and dare I say context related, in that like salt or, or heat or fire or water or food, many things, it is very dose and context and circumstance related uh, as to whether it is a potential benefit or a potential hazard. Uh, particularly as many of the uh, worst sort of musculoskeletal disorders can be really slow onset, chronic onset. So why do we do this? Well, I believe that we do it to make a difference. Uh, assessing risk by itself is completely useless if that's all we do. Uh, and in many cases in managing safety or performing or working in safety or working in a job where we manage occupational health and safety, uh, if some of the best mentors I've had have said if, if it's a known and very well known problem, don't waste your time doing risk assessments, fix it. And that's probably salutary when we're talking about the um, analysis and assessment of musculoskeletal risk. So there's all sorts of reasons why we do it. There's a, why we do the assessment or analysis of this sort of risk. Uh, there's a lot of noise, as you well know, I'm sure I'm speaking to people who have had a lot of experience. 
Uh, there is all sorts of measures around this lost time injury frequency rates and total recordable industry in injuries and, and many, many things which we can see dramatic changes in, some of which are related to the risk and some of which are related to the damage that occurs and some of which relate to completely different factors. It can be just recategorisation or redefining. Um, so sometimes it's a really good news story and sometimes it's just noise. So one of the Key questions we've asked ourselves in the team that I worked with over the years is, so what? So we can analyse, we can assess, we can get fantastic software, we can get equipment now to help us measure things that we would have had to mortgage a house for 15 years ago, now we can sell it like ice cream. Um, what does it mean? Are we doing something that's accurate, reliable and useful? So I think in my 25 years working in ergonomics and in safety, we've seen a lot of activity in work-related musculoskeletal disorder and, and for decades before I came along. Uh, a lot of activity, um, a lot of wheel spinning, I dare say, uh, and a great deal of work that we've done has been initiated reactively, I think. Um, I won't read every word on the screen, you can read better than I can, and I'm, I'm sure that there's lots of other post-it notes you could put up there as to why do we currently jump in and assess MSD risk? What, what, what are the drivers? Why do we do it? How do we do it? Um, there's, there's a vast range. Uh, some of them are up there on the screen. So leading into what we're doing and I say we, um, which is the Joint Action Group, Joint Action Solutions, but more broadly than that, there's lots of people all around the world um, automating all sorts of things, and including out in our little corner in ergonomics and in um, manual tasks and um, work-related musculoskeletal disorder analysis. Uh, there's various ways of doing it, but the purpose, the purpose again is to help us analyse what's going on. The automation of itself is not the, the goal. It uses a variety of really clever um, technologies, software and hardware. Uh, at the moment, there's a mix of things being used, uh, wearable sensors and video. Um, there's pluses and minuses for both. The best active research at the moment is saying that a mixture of both uh, works best um, because you have this trade-off between how many sensors do you want to put on a person um, to get enough data to make meaningful analysis without inconveniencing them or interrupting their work or creating um, a distraction, which could be a hazard of itself. Uh, video gets rid of most of those problems, but it's uh, while you use one camera, which is typically how it's done, whether it be a phone or something, um, there, there, there is inaccuracies in it. So a combination of the two works. So to get that accurate, reliable, analysis, that's where the technology is up to. Uh, it is more objective than um, people like myself who are reasonably trained and pretty well experienced in doing um, hazardous manual task risk analysis, ergonomic analysis, etc. cetera, um, just because uh, technologies can measure angles quicker and faster than, than most of us. Um, and the uh, strength of software is that it can do things very quickly. We've got to tell it what to do, as you know well. Uh, but you can get immediate analysis and report, which I love. I love not having to go back to a desk and write a report. That's one of the great benefits. So what we've got on the screen is uh, the, the kit that we've built, that we use. It uses five sensors, one on the uh, the head for the, for the top of the spine, one uh, at the uh, base of the neck, one at the base of the, uh, well, basically at the base of the lumbar spine. It's not critical exactly where it's located, but it's there just above the pelvis. And then one for each upper limb. Uh, we used to mount them above their wrists, but now we've found, um, for reasons I won't go into today, but putting them above the elbows gets more accurate um, analysis of the risk to shoulders. We haven't got to doing the wrists and fingers uh, or lower limbs yet. That That is coming and that will be added in by uh, video data. What that person was doing, I just moved on, was working in a gold room of a gold mine, surprise, surprise, and, and doing a task which they do every day. And the uh, analysis of that task and the reporting was done in a matter of minutes. That's, that's how it works. 
So what's the usefulness of this? Well, it's easier. Um, Jazz is just our joint action solutions. That's what we've called our system. Uh, for example, I went to a warehouse, logistic warehouse uh, on Monday, hadn't been there before. I uh, was able to do 23 uh, risk assessments and reports uh, in two and a half hours, and that wasn't rushing, that was uh, good interaction, really good interaction with the workers and supervisors, and walk out of there with a thorough analysis of their tasks. And it, I, I couldn't have dreamed of doing that a few years ago. Uh, that would have been a week's work. The information is objective, and I'll come back a little bit more to that. It's not 100% objective. Uh, I think there's, there is room for um, improvement there, but there's also the trade-off there of wanting interaction and consultation and buy-in from people. Um, the information is, is uh, hyper secure. We're, we're health professionals. We believe in being very, very careful about privacy, um, as we should. And uh, it's delivered to a central portal. It, it's available there, stored. As soon as you've got web connection, you don't need it while you're doing the assessment. You can have it. Um, it's uploaded and it's there to make use of and scrutinise uh, and can be really useful for tracking things across a business or an enterprise across time. Um, I'll come back to the risk analysis part of it. A lot of what we've done in the past is more like hazard identification and hazard categorisation rather than really analysing the risk. What this allows us that based on the data we get, we can burrow into where the sources of the risk are coming from. We might have a something that we regard, regard as a high risk hazardous manual task, but exactly where the bits are, we can get to very quickly. For example, it might be somebody um, reaching into the, the top, as we saw before, of something and needing to elevate and uh, rotate their, their, their upper limb uh, repetitively across 15 minutes several times a day. And, and it can be that, that sort of information where we can go right to the uh, key points. We can then slice and dice the information and see how we're tracking, are we making any difference? We think we're brilliant, we think we put the right, right risk controls in, uh, are they having an effect? We quickly measure that as well. So I might just pause for a moment to go through some of the things. You, you'll have lists that you know very well. Um, Work-related musculoskeletal disorders is multifactorial, many factors involved, as you know. Uh, some of them are really obvious and well-known, uh, body posture, body movement. Uh, it's not just actions, it's postures, as you know. Um, vibration, of course, loads and forces is probably the one to go to. Um, things like temperature extreme and the pace of work and locus of control and perceived control over your own body, over your own work, over your own choices. Uh, as we know, they're the things that are a bit softer and don't get talked about so often, but very, very real. Communication and training, and where the, uh, uh, the leaders in the world, I think, are up to at the moment is putting some really good work into looking at the rest, recovery, load, and characteristics of load and recovery uh, that is looking beyond the task and looking across the shift and even across the roster and the scheduling of work um, and, and things like task rotation come into it, but really having a look at the interplay of all the factors that I'd have up there on the screen, plus others, um, the psychosocial ones I'll come to, and the recovery cycles, which has been something that we've guessed at a little bit, but the technology is helping us do it a bit better, and it's exciting um, current and upcoming work that's going on. I mentioned before that the origins are multifactorial, and you, you know that well, and the um, organisational factors, the business, the interrelationships between the supervisors and the managers and the I'm just reflecting here for a moment. I worked in high hazard industries in underground gold mining, um, long way underground in, in some cases. And some of the best answers I heard when the captains of the industry came together and started talking about some of these organisational factors 
was talking about it starting at board level. So I'm going broad there, but it, it, is, um, it is a really, really important area. The psychosocial factors, which is getting justifiably more attention now, and the interaction between the, the organisational, the psychosocial factors and the individual factors as they affect work-related musculoskeletal, because they affect many things, as you know well, um, but there's also strong and proven relationship between these things and work-related musculoskeletal disorders, which believe it or not, uh, is looking very possible, very real. Um, we're halfway through the work of integrating some of those into the automated risk analysis. Some of it will be manual input, but I'll, I'll mention that as we go. Um, but the, it's wonderful, really, to think that we, we will start to be able to, including these core relations, really, of work-related MSD analysis and, and risk management in, into the mainstream of it. And I think that's one of the things that the automation might make possible. I'm no fan of automation for its own sake, but if it makes the management of hazards and prevention of injury more possible, well, I'll grab it with both hands. And I'm quite excited about being able to plug these things into what used to be a very physically uh, oriented work-related MSD analysis. So one of the things that before um, you know, we've joined Action, we've been at this for 15 years as a team together. Um, we've, we've always been up front saying if we don't address it as a multifactorial problem, then we're not going to get any results. And um, the, the industry partners we've worked with have been terrific in that regard. Uh, and without, it comes back to why do any analysis? Well, if you can prevent the problem without spending time on risk assessment, risk analysis, do it. Um, if you don't, in many cases, with, we don't know, it, it, you can't put a good risk control in place unless you know something about the characteristics of the risk. So how do we currently manage? Well, I, I'd suggest that at the left-hand side there, the hazard reviews, that's the uh, that's at the better end. Um, it's the prevention focus and we move along and probably reacting to the claims or the cost of claims, is, which is a driver, it really is. I mean, we've all been involved in a lot of work with it where that has initiated the action, um, but it's at the reactive end. And um, it would be nice to move things a little bit more towards the left-hand side of the screen. And uh, I'll hold my hand up and say in the days when I was um, safety manager in underground mining, I have a passion for ergonomics and for what we're talking about now, and I didn't attend to it quite up front and honestly I said I, I uh, ignored it because it wasn't going to kill anybody on this shift and there was other things that took my attention that were priorities and took everyone else's attention um, as in ground stability, in rush, breathable air uh, and all those things you, you, you know are important in those high hazard industries and others um, and work related MSD was too time consuming and never got the attention that it needed. It was where most of the injuries came from, but it wasn't immediately. Immediately, I emphasised life-threatening, so it didn't get a Guernsey. One of the reasons that I'm really keen on this automation and being able to make things possible and take the time and cost out of doing something useful about it. I mentioned before the understanding of risk. I'm a great believer in that. You, to, you need to understand it to manage it. Um, and moving, if we can, away from a reactive process uh, to a real prevention process real preventative focus and um, the automated analysis and reporting has to live up to that simple. Anyone can make something complex, it's no good to us. We need something simple, accurate, quick, cost effective uh, and all of the other words on the screen there which you can see. One of the things that I worry about a drift in the automation of data gathering and reporting and the movement of this into work health and safety management is that we shift to monitoring and managing the person rather than managing the hazard. So I guess the schools have thought about that, but the Australian codes of practice and, and our 
or around safety and regarding hazardous manual tasks, it's very clear that our job is to, to manage the hazards associated with the task, which is what our system focuses on and our reporting focuses on. Just doing a time check here. So what does it do? Well, Dr Forbes Smith, who is one of the mentors in joint action, uh, who's worked all over the world. He spent uh, the first chunk of his life working on trawlers in the North Sea, then the Merchant Navy and the Royal Navy, and then decided to become a doctor later and has uh, done an enormous amount of work in back injury and back injury prevention. Um, he talks about needing to drag ourselves away from reactive and to an upstream model of care. He didn't invent the term, the Canadians did. They seem to take the lead in a lot of ergonomics things and they continue to. Um, but an upstream model of care. So rather than being the doctor in the operating theatre, which he spent many years doing, um, let's see what we can do prior. So um, I guess I'm preaching a little bit there. I apologise for it, but it, it's not a bad thing to remind ourselves. So being able to automate or speed up or make more accurate or not need years of training to be able to do really accurate reports and assessments which is the purpose of the Joint Action Solutions Equipment and other automated MSD risk analysis and reporting equipment is allows us to, to do that analysis and to get a, a really good picture of what's happening in a business. And what do I mean by that? We talk about hazard identification and we talk about risk assessment and quite often they get a bit blurred, uh, particularly in hazardous manual tasks. But if we can do a really accurate risk assessment and report in under 10 minutes, in something more like six minutes, what happens is that, and it happens with me, it happens with many others, and it happens with some of our biggest customers who do have done something nudging 100,000 of these assessments with the logistics company across Australia over the last two years. Um, they've got quite a workforce. Um, it allows you to assess every task. It, it doesn't take long, it, it, it isn't intrusive, it isn't costly. In fact, it costs cents in the dollar, quite literally, um, you know, under two dollars to do an assessment. Um, and so we can really do a really accurate hazard identification, quickly do a search as to where the key risks are, to which parts of the body, to which sorts of people, not, not, not persons, but which sorts of people in what roles, are. Uh, the, the problems are and we can then, as can be done on, on paper or on spreadsheets and it's been done many times in the past, but this allows us very quickly and accurately to um, hypothetical risk controls to see what effect they have on which bits of the risk. Um, so we can do all that really quickly and it just allows that prevention improvement cycle to happen um, more objectively and most importantly, it's it's doable. I come back to the doable word. I come back to managing, having a, a job and a really supportive board and management team um, that would have backed me in if I focused on uh, musculoskeletal disorders in underground miners, but there was just not the time to do it. No there are other priorities. This sort of automated system would allow somebody to do it as part of their supervisory role or part of their HSR, health and safety rep role. So I won't read every word on the screen, I don't believe in it, uh, but one of the things that has been the experience with joint action over the years, and the word, we use the word joint for obvious a play on words, but one of the key bits is that it's an interaction between us and businesses and between the workers and the managers in the business. That's not new to any of us, but it's certainly a, a must, I think, if we're going to make inroads into preventing what is always the uh, most prevalent work-related injury in workplace, and that is the good old musculoskeletal disorders. Um, where there's been good buy-in and, and good uh, follow-up, which goes way beyond risk analysis, but it's a good starting point. Uh, the, we always said that if we weren't making a 20% difference, that we shouldn't be there and we haven't measured it, other people have, um, and there's always been the 23 or 26% uh, 
claims cost reduction, which is a pretty ugly measure, but it's a pretty honest one because the business knows how much money they're paying out every year. Um, I'm very careful with those sort of measurements and making too much of them, um, but that, that has been the historical fact. So there's information there about the joint action system. We can come back to that if you'd like to, but the, the key bit up there for me is that time and cost efficient. It's time and cost efficient. I keep going back to that. It makes possible what, what wasn't possible before. So if automation of analysis and reporting has great value, that, that's where it sits. Some other things about the system to mention is that we have got a, a good team, I believe. Um, we're all more enthusiastic about the the quality of the work than um, we're, we're not terrific business people. That's why we've brought in wonderful people like Gary to help lead us in that. But uh, we've worked in this area of R&D and practice of uh, work health and safety for quite a while. And so we've got um, Dr. Steve Cowley, who was in uh, Australia for 28 years. He is now back in the UK, living in a beautiful part of Wales. So he has done the work of comparing, contrasting and analysing uh, the analysis basis that we use with not just what we have in Australia, but also the really good tools that are used in the UK from the Health and Safety Executive and some of those used in North America. So um, we haven't done anything brilliant or new there. We've just put it together. What we have done is, uh, and this predates the automation, is had the privilege of working with a couple of industries, uh, 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 the, the shearing industry and a manuf large international manufacturer and looked at seven years worth of MSD claims um, and which was something like the order of 15,000 claims but there was quite a project over a seven year period there where we were able to look at the outcome, the sources of the injury and the damage outcomes in terms of time off work and dollars and that is what we use in joint action as the weighting for the exposure to um, fine-grained risk. And if, when I say fine-grained risk, for example, we, rather than saying, is the person's back bent, and we'll say, is the person's back bent, and there'll be four or five categories of degree, uh, then there'll be another category of rotation, uh, rotation with hands away from the body, all those things that are really stock standard, but what we're able to do is make it more fine-grained um, because software allows us to do that. And then there's a weighting um, from the damage from those um, 15,000 claims outcomes that uh, are used to do that. So we haven't invented the system. We've used um, that is, uh, Ilium Worth, I think. It's a really well-founded, well-used uh, safety uh, categorisation um, methods. Uh, and that's plugged into the back end of the system. That's not about the automation, but it's, it's what the automation is running on to do the analysis. On a more practical front, um, in the last 20 months, it's been really important to be able to uh, be working remotely and hands off. So the, there doesn't need to be any physical contact between the person doing the assessment and the person doing the task. Um, that that's, can be done in a really sanitised way. Uh, so it can be done with um, experts on site or off site. And importantly, running the system doesn't need any more expertise than running your own mobile phone, um, probably less in some ways. Uh, you need to be able to turn it on and off and put the sensors on and off or uh, put the sensors in front of the people after they've been sanitised and, and allow them to put them on and off. Uh, one of the side benefits, and this was a surprise, uh, is that for injury management and return to work management, um, which uh, some of us in joint action did a lot of over the years, I've spent many years doing occupational rehabilitation work, um, the task demands libraries are an adjunct, they're a spin-off from doing the risk assessments. So they are developed without um, any need for doing anything else. Excuse me, I just need to take a sip of water. Sorry about that. Yes, one, one of the things that I think most people working in ergonomics or, or physio or OT or many, many related fields, um, get asked to do task libraries, which is a whole lot of work um, of doing the minute of what's involved as far as physical loading and requirements for any job. And they tend to be a bit static and therefore don't get used 
very much or very well. Some of you might have really good experience with them, many of us haven't. Um, but one of the beauties of the being able to do automated um, task analysis is that you get an immediate task library and you can just push a button on the screen and get it straight away. Uh, you can update it um, very quickly and easily in, in, by just running another assessment. Uh, for example, a worker might have come back to work, you might say, well, we're only going to use um, six out of the eight elements in, in a particular set of tasks, therefore we'd like to know what they look like so we can quickly print those or email, do, the, do them on the screen, push the button, send them off as an email attachment to the, the treating doctor. That, that all becomes uh, so easy uh, without any extra effort from doing um, your risk assessments. So, the identification, the analysis of the key contributing factors is, is, a, is a take home from this. I think the beauty of the software in multiplying what our intelligence can do, it doesn't add to the intelligence, it just makes quick use of it. It enables the analysis of the key contributing factors at a level which we really haven't had enough time to do before and we can quickly do what used to take a little while and we can say, well, what, what happens if we uh, eliminate this part of the job by using a particular bit of equipment or what about if we did it a different way or took 50 millimetres off the edge of the um, conveyor uh, surround, which is exactly the sort of thing we do. Um, what, what would happen? And you can run that on the screen and see what impact it has on which bit of the risk and, and the overall risk score. Uh, and the evaluation and monitoring of sustained effectiveness, yeah, it's always there in most of the projects and processes and it mostly doesn't get done, I dare say. You might be better than me, but I haven't worked in many places where that gets done terribly well. Um, it's made easier by automating. So numbers. So this is real experience and I'm always very cautious with numbers. The, the first one uh, I mentioned, that's, that's ours. Uh, I'd stand by that, that's real and that's a pretty ugly measure of uh, how much uh, is paid out in dollars for MSD claims components by businesses that we've worked with over the years. Our customers tell us they've had this 54% reduction in work-related MSDs. I would suspect there's more things going on there than simply analysing the tasks. Obviously, analysing the task by itself does nothing, uh, and they might be the, the leading business um, units in that large organisation that reported that. Um, interestingly, the ones in that um, logistics business across the country, the, the poorer performers, they weren't that far away. They're at 32%. Uh, the risk reduction rate is just the risk reduction rate. That's saying we did risk assessments on these tasks. We came back six months later and we did risk assessments, and the score overall was 18 less. So. All the numbers head in the right direction. The actual quantum of them um, is always up for debate, but uh, effectiveness uh, is proven, I think, it's with um, making use of good analysis and making use of, as I say, doing over 100,000 of these assessments and reports, which means it just becomes part of the normal process. People are used to it. Um, I'll come to some other benefits there in a moment. Uh, there's the risk scoring system we use. With we haven't made that up. Uh, we, we use that method. I uh, mentioned before the um, make the relationship to the Australian codes and the UK Health and Safety Executive, uh, and also mentioned the task focus. We keep coming back to that task focus. There's an area that it isn't automated as far as input and we think it's really important. So typically when you run an assessment, you'll be standing there uh, or not standing there if you're remote, but somebody will do the task, they'll finish the task, you'll hit stop, and then you have the option of putting in more information, which from my point of view is crucial. Um, task repeats at the moment is something you need to ask and you need to ask the question about uh, how long do you do this before there's at least a one minute break to get the repetitiveness and recovery um, data accurate. 
Uh, if you ask somebody how long they do something, they might say, I do this for two hours, then I have a break, then I do something else. Um, but if you ask the question, how long do you do this before you need to reach and get a new packet of gaskets or uh, walk around the other side of the machine and check the gauge, uh, they'll say, oh, about five minutes, about 10 minutes, 20 minutes. So that, that's a key question. Um, the duration is then easy. Um, you might not want or you might not have the opportunity to get the full task duration. You might get a six minute bit of it. Um, yeah, but the person will say that it normally takes, or the supervisor will tell you how long it takes and you can plug that in easily and that's pretty accurate. Um, perceived load, at the moment we don't use load cells, we use the um, sports based um, perceived load. That, that has um, pluses as well as um, negatives um, because what's a load for me might not be a load for someone else uh, and that, that um, does populate that whole area of um, a broad risk assessment matrix uh, and we find it's quite accurate. In the future there may be load cells going into under people's feet but I'm not sure whether it's going to add anything and I would probably think that asking perceived load is something that we would continue to do. As I mentioned before I think these are really important to get a really accurate analysis and there is a really really lovely um, side benefit because we're told that consultation is important and the having something that has a visual representation, not a visual representation, it's a video of the person doing the task in real time with real useful and very intuitive graphs showing on the screen as to what's going on and it'll show shaded areas where you move into sustained awkward. By the way, movement isn't a problem by itself. Manual work isn't a problem by itself. In fact, it's a real benefit. Uh, I'll have somebody getting me to do some physical exercise um, when I finish here today. Um, obviously, it's a really healthy thing. So what's shown on the screen is where it goes over the, those thresholds and becomes a hazardous manual task. So that can be seen with a video running, with graphs representing movement, with little bars showing how much movement and shaded areas going, hey, you've moved into sustained or repetitive or really awkward postures or whatever. That's not meant, to, not meant as a behavioural tool, it's just nice feedback and the people can see the report immediately, the supervisors can, and it generates this buy-in and often it generates immediate problem solving and putting people like me out of the job. We've had that experience, which is just beautiful, where people start actually looking at it and going, well, we can do it differently. How about we move this over here? And all of a sudden it generates some um, consultation without anybody even mentioning the word. It's um, really terrific to, to be involved in that at times. So I, th I think we do get better risk controls, uh, less scattergun approach, less um, hoping and, and more um, data-based, um, accurate, objective uh, decision making. Uh, it, it just helps, particularly with um, justification of expenditure. You know, if we're going to get a, a powered uh, trolley rather than, uh, or a tug rather than uh, the, the manual pallet jack to move something, where's the, yes, it's a nice to have, is it really effective in, in reducing a particular uh, part of the risk that comes from um, spinal rotation with one hand at work or, or is it not? So it really helps with that targeting and uh, also one of the nice things about being able to have the, um, the information available in a portal, I've been using it this week, uh, is that a, that a client, a person, a customer, a business, uh, a, a safety um, consultant or whoever can start looking at things across sites and go, well, hang on, how about um, we look at what's happening in, in the leaders and laggers and, and finding out what the difference is and, and allowing um, the information from one to help the other. Why is it? Um, because it has shown benefits and uh, it's up to people to measure that themselves, but there has been um, uh, uh, only positive outcomes. Uh, how The quantum of them I'm always very cautious of. I'm very wary about safety people claiming great percentage changes in uh, in risk and whatnot. Um, I'd rather work with the customer and, and to let the real experience speak for itself, but the numbers have been positive. Um, 
won't summarise everything verbally that's on the screen, you can see it, but the, at the top right there, the indirect benefits, I, I alluded to that, and I think that is very real, very real, and that consultation and, and that morale, and I come back to the um, psychosocial, organisational, and um, those things that are, have been the, the poor rallies of work-related MSD prevention, they get a real boost from that interaction that I just mentioned, uh, and even some more in allowing quick and effective without stopping production, people having real input into the design of their jobs. Uh, it, it just becomes a bit more doable. So next steps. The next steps is for me to have a break from talking. Uh, I've talked for a long time. I thank you for your attention and I'll hand back to Stephanie now for questions. Thank you, Michael. So as Michael said, uh, we'll now take uh, any audience uh, questions. Please use the questions pane on your control panel um, to type those questions. Uh, so just a reminder, um, Michael, uh, JAS, uh, what does it stand for again? Joint Action Solutions. So we, we're Joint Action Forever. Uh, which is a play on words about working jointly with, with customers and workers and managers working together and us interacting with people. So joint action, uh, MSD, uh, injuries don't happen halfway between your elbow and your wrist. They tend to happen at your elbow or your wrist if they're, so my point is, MSD injuries happen at joints generally uh, and joint action solutions is focused on that. Thank you. Another question, how much does it cost to implement a system like JAS? That's where Gary, our CEO, is the, but, but I can give you some parameters. Um, the cost is around the, and I'm going to show that I'm an ergonomist, not a business person here, um, so I'll, give, I'll just be daring and please, there's a caveat on this because I'm not sure of the exact cost, but in the order of $5,000 to get into it. Sometimes there's a bit more than that if there's training, on-site training, we can do remote or on-site training. And depending on what you use, but in the order of $900 a month um, for the support and the use of the system and, and the uh, ongoing various supports and software upgrades that happen constantly, that's our big cost is the, the very, very good um, program developers that uh, are working constantly. Um, which depending on your situation, some people say it costs too much, some people say too little, but to give you an example, to do one risk assessment and report um, with an ergonomist or even with using some of the other systems that have been around in the past is in the order of two grand. Um, the cost to our um, most prolifically using customer, if I can put it in that ugly way, is down around $2 an assessment because they're doing 10,000 a month. But so it's, if you make use of it, uh, if you have use for it, um, very cost effective. Thank you, Michael. Who do you think should be using JAS? People who are involved with preventing work from manual, uh, injuries from manual work. Uh, really it's, and manual work, let me put, is not just lifting things and putting it down. It might be driving a haul truck on a, on a mine site. It, it might be uh, driving a forklift at a logistic site. So uh, manual tasks or where work-related MSD might happen. I've often said that I was kept busy for many years by truck drivers and nurses, and the truck drivers never lifted anything, but they had a lot of back injuries. So uh, where there is manual tasks or or associated MSD risk, the people who can and should use it are those people who want to prevent the injuries. And they it's definitely, the whole purpose of building this JAS kit is that it give, puts people like me out of a job um, of doing risk assessments. So anybody. Thank you, Michael. Does Joint Action Group publish any reports, uh, et cetera, with all the data collected um, from your clients? No, we, we certainly, there's two bits to that answer. The, the data is private, it belongs 
to the licensee, to the client, and it's also very protected electronically and privacy-wise. Privacy um, obviously, we have administrator um, assistance role there, but the data is theirs, not ours. That There's very um, careful privacy management um, so that there's no identifiers unless the client decides that with their, with their workforce they want to allow that. There's automatic face blurring. There's, there's all sorts of things there to, to privacy. However, um, with, with what we can make available to anyone who's interested are redacted reports uh, that give you all the information other than the, the business and the personal identifiers. So if people want that information, we're very happy to give them everything we can. All right, thanks, Michael. Is uh, JAS used by any regulators? If you're able to broadly uh, talk in that space. No, I, 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 not, not yet, though the, the ergonomists in, in um, your counterparts in Queensland have shown some real interest in the last couple of months. So, in fact, they, they've given us permission to use some of their uh, assessment systems on our platform, so which is pretty nice. So, not yet, but there's a relationship developing there. All right, thanks, Michael. And just a reminder, there's still time to submit any questions via the questions window on your control panel for today's presenter, Michael Lawrence from Joint Action Group, PTY LTD. Today's session is also being uh, recorded and will be made available after WorkSafe uh, month at the end of October on WorkSafe Tasmania's YouTube page. A question, Michael. How do you think JAS might be able to contribute to the work of a regulator? I think, in, in really simple terms, it's a really simple concept. It's it's taking what has been done with NSD risk assessment and analysis. It takes the Australian Code of Practice. It, it follows it faithfully, including the the, the checklist. It just expands it. Uh, enormously and makes more fine grain. So in a way, it just helps the regulator do what the regulator does. If the regulator wanted to say, here's a, a, a tool to make it possible to do a really accurate, let me put it another way, in, in the, um, where is it? It's probably in the code of practice uh, that talks about, uh, there might be times when you need to get an expert in to, to help you with the, the analysis of hazardous manual tasks, yeah? This does this for you. It, it, it makes it reachable. It makes it affordable for people to, to do it and do it, it really well. So the, the use for the regulator is in, in just being able to say to the, the people they're there for, the, the businesses and the workers, here's something that can help you do what you should be doing anyway. Thank you, Michael. With no further questions coming through, Michael, um, I'll begin. Oh, actually, um, so just a, just a comment. Uh, looks like a really useful product, and and um, I really appreciate the uh, the presentation. So, in in line with that, Michael, um, I'll wrap up today's uh, WorkSafe Tasmania Month session. So thank you, Michael Lawrence from Joint Action Group PTY LTD, and thank you everyone for attending today's WorkSafe Tasmania Month webinar, MSD Risk Analysis, a data-driven approach. Once you do leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey. We do appreciate you providing us with your feedback. Today's session has also been recorded and will be made available shortly on WorkSafe Tasmania's YouTube page. To find out more about Tasmania's WorkSafe Tasmania Month, please head to worksafe.tas.gov.au to find out about other sessions that we are running throughout October, including other initiatives funded by the Work Cover Tasmania Board delivered by WorkSafe Tasmania. On behalf of the Work Cover Tasmania Board and WorkSafe Tasmania, thank you for joining us.